Just as every modern stock market crash has an external catalyst, each collapse has been fueled by a new, poorly understood financial contraption that introduces leverage into a system that is already unstable. In 1907, that contraption was the trust companies that were essentially ungoverned and piratical. In addition to the absolute lack of reserves, much of the collateral securing trust company loans were illiquid and couldn't be easily sold to pay off the loans. It might take months to liquidate raw land, and if so, it could be at a substantial loss. This explains why banks were prohibited from owning land unless it was through foreclosure. The facilities and machinery securing a bridge loan to allow for an industrial combination might have no value outside the businesses that used it, and if it did have value, it might similarly take months to sell and relocate before the loan could be satisfied. As is true with all the financial contraptions that have led to modern stock market crashes, the trust companies worked beautifully when the sun was shining, but once storm clouds formed and a gale started to blow, the trust companies weren't able to drop their sales. Instead, the leverage inherent in their unreserved structure meant that they became more exposed as the storm worsened. Leverage means that a $1 decline in a stock price might generate $2 in losses for shareholders using leverage. Those losses might force investors to sell, driving the price down another $3 and generating $6 in losses for the remaining levered shareholders, some of whom are now forced to sell, driving the price down another $9 again producing outsized losses for the remaining shareholders, some of whom will be forced to sell for whatever they can get. But leverage isn't necessarily financial, it can also be behavioral. One depositor, knowing that the trust companies are able to pay higher rates of interest because they keep less in reserve and more in illiquid assets, might demand the return of his deposit and warn friends to do the same. As word spreads, the price of the stock cascades lower or the line of depositors demanding their money overwhelms the system, not because it can't handle their reasonable demands but because an unstable system, made unstable by a massive rally in asset prices, an external catalyst like an earthquake, a belligerent change in government policy, and a poorly understood, poorly designed financial contraption like 1907's trust companies, injects leverage suddenly. The system can't handle the chain reaction of their cascading demands simultaneously. Friction never overcomes tension, so the tremor becomes an earthquake. As Heinz and Morse were losing their jobs, and as the stock market was panicking, J.P. Morgan was attending an Episcopal convention in Richmond, Virginia. Teddy Roosevelt was even more out of touch, just as he had been when McKinley passed, hunting an astonishing menagerie of animals in the remote cane breaks of Louisiana. Morgan was kept updated by wire and initially declined to return to New York early, fearing that doing so would lead to even more fear in the market. When he eventually decided on Saturday, 19th October, that he would return the next day, he explained to the bishop, they are in trouble in New York. They do not know what to do, and I don't know what to do, but I am going back. As Morgan was being updated, Roosevelt remained isolated. When asked on Saturday, in the middle of his hunting trip, about the financial chaos breaking out in New York, Roosevelt replied with a list of the animals he had just killed, including three bears, six deer, 
one wild turkey, twelve squirrels, one duck, one opossum, and one wild cat. The headlines on Monday morning, 21st October, were reassuring. One on the front page of the New York Times promised banks sound will be banned. After reporting with a slightly sinister tone that Heinz and Morse had been eliminated from all banking organizations in New York City, the paper of record, and the businessman's Bible in the days before the Wall Street Journal's rise to prominence went on to remind readers that depositors were expected to do their duty by meeting the situation with coolness and calm judgment. Despite this, on Monday, 21st October, the panic of the panic of 1907 set in. The stock market had lost 5.9% during the previous week and was now down 35.5% for 1907, but it was about to get much worse. While most New Yorkers knew little about the relationship between Charles Morse, Fritz Heinz, and Charles Barney, the insiders at the city's largest banks were aware of their interlocking business connections. Barney was a director of Morse National Bank of North America and the New Amsterdam National Bank, two of the banks Morse had daisy chained together. Barney also served on the board of Morse American Ice Company and was a large shareholder in his consolidated steamship lines, which controlled steamship traffic along the East Coast. Knickerbocker Trust also held sizable stakes in these companies, as well as Morse American Ice Securities Company, the Clyde Steamship Company, and the Butterick Company and all three were on the board of the Mercantile National Bank. Although Saturday's newspapers proclaimed Mercantile Sound, by Monday Barney's involvement in the scheme was well known among bankers, and questions about the viability of his Knickerbocker Trust had been whispered during the weekend. The National Bank of Commerce had been the Knickerbocker's agent with the clearing house, but rather than going down with Barney, the National Bank of Commerce announced it would no longer clear for the Knickerbocker. The Knickerbocker, which had been a financial island, was now completely adrift, unable to present checks drawn on other banks for payment. Despite this, thanks to the reassuring headlines declaring the bank's sound, as well as J.P. Morgan's presence in the city, the market rebounded on Monday, gaining 3.7% to close at 60.81. It was still down 10.2% for the month and 35.5% for the year. By the next day, Tuesday, 22nd October, it wasn't just banking insiders who knew about the connection between Heinz, Morse, and Barney and were questioning the Knickerbocker's survival, that morning's papers reported that Barney had resigned from the Knickerbocker late the previous day and that he'd been forced out because of his connection with Mr. Morse and the Morse companies. Asked if the Knickerbocker was in trouble, Barney scoffed, nothing could be more absurd, the company was never in a stronger position. Depositors weren't so certain. With October 22's ambiguous headline, Knickerbocker will be aided, but the certain news that Heinz, Barney, and Morse were connected, depositors took no chances. They lined up to withdraw their money. By the time the Knickerbocker opened for business at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, more than 100 depositors were waiting in line. Fifteen minutes after the doors opened, the line reached from the tellers to the sidewalk as the tellers closed accounts and pushed stacks of bills across the marble counters, through the bronze gates inside the mahogany woodwork. Next to each teller were stacks of currency, bound in $2,000 lots. A stack would dwindle and disappear, 
and the teller would reach for the next stack to pay the next depositor. Soon every bit of the lobby was consumed by depositors, waiting in line with bags to take away their cash as tellers slowed their counting in an effort to make the stacks last and get to closing time without having exhausted the cash. After a check for $1.5 million drawing on the Knickerbocker was presented by Hanover National Bank, which was followed by a check for $1 million presented by a different bank, the demands of depositors who wanted their money back overwhelmed Knickerbocker's small cash reserve. After returning $8 million to depositors in just three hours, the Knickerbocker Trust was forced to halt payments. Many of those already inside refused to leave. Those still outside rattled the doors, demanding information. Investors had lost faith in the Knickerbocker literally overnight, and a bank run that lasted just three hours forced the closing of one of the largest, most connected, best-known financial firms in New York City. The Dow lost 2.8% that day, to close at 59.11, and was now down 12.7% for the month and 37.4% for the year. On Wednesday, 23rd October, the New York Times front page featured a story about Ringling Brothers combining with Barnum and Bailey, but there was another story about another circus, the Knickerbocker Trust, and the news was bad for depositors. The Knickerbocker would not reopen after Tuesday's run. Despite the spreading panic, other news on the front page was good. The largest type of the edition was reserved for the headline reporting that the Trust Company of America TCA, would be aided via loans from J.P. Morgan's syndicate. In the era before the Federal Reserve Bank, J.P. Morgan was the unofficial but unrivaled leader of the country's financial community and as such was the country's lender of last resort. Morgan was now 70 years old. He had turned 69 on the day before the San Francisco earthquake. He was trying to untangle himself from his bank's day-to-day -day affairs. He wanted to get on with his collecting of art and antique manuscripts, and he was counting on his son, Jack, to take over. But just as Teddy Roosevelt had been the only Republican who could win the governorship of New York in 1898, J.P. Morgan was the only financer who might stop the panic of 1907. The headlines about the Trust Company of America were premature and counterproductive. As TCA depositors read of what had happened to the Knickerbocker Trust and that it wouldn't reopen, and that their own trust company was in need of saving, they decided not to take the chance. They lined up outside the TCA just as they had lined up outside the Knickerbocker the day before. J.P. Morgan's son-in-law reported that the line of depositors extended down Wall Street and around the corner into William Street. While it was certainly true that Heinz, Barney and Morse were connected by joint business dealings, the extent of the connection was not yet obvious to outsiders. What was obvious was that Morse fostered a closer examination of the relationship that ousted Barney from the Knickerbocker and led to its failure, likely in a devious attempt to misdirect attention from his own banks to the Knickerbocker, in an even more extreme example of the sort of perfidy he had demonstrated by selling his shares of United Copper and then remaining quiet when the Heinz brothers told him they suspected short sellers were at work. While trying to explain away the troubles of his two largest banks, 
the Bank of North America and the New Amsterdam Bank, Morse told investigators from the New York Clearing House that they should look around in other places too. Soon new concerns for the health of the Knickerbocker were being whispered. As the Knickerbocker Trust was closing its doors, never to reopen, Morgan charged Benjamin Strong, a 34-year-old man he barely knew, with answering a simple question. Morgan wanted Strong to spend Tuesday evening reviewing the Trust Company of America's assets and liabilities, and then decide if the institution was solvent. Morgan had just met Strong, who had been recommended by Henry Davison, who had in turn been recommended by George Baker, president of First National Bank. Baker had Morgan's full confidence when Morgan gave Strong his assignment. In giving his report at 12.30 p.m. the next day, in the midst of the run on TCA, Strong tried to give a full picture of the TCA's situation. But Morgan wasn't interested in that. He simply wanted to know if Strong thought the TCA was solvent. Strong asked the assembled experts for their opinion of the value of several large loans TCA had made. When Morgan and his group said those loans were likely good, Strong said he believed the TCA was solvent and that any loans made by Morgan and his associates to prop up TCA were safe. Hearing this, Morgan was resolute, this is the place to stop the trouble, then. Morgan ordered TCA President Oakley Thorne to bring any securities the TCA had taken in as collateral to JP Morgan and Company at 23 Wall Street. Based on Strong's assurance, Morgan would loan as much as the collateral Thorne presented would allow. At 1 p.m. the line outside TCA was growing, and the available cash had dwindled to $1.20 million. Thirty minutes later the cash balance was only $800,000. With 45 minutes left in TCA's normal business day, the run-by. Depositors had reduced TCA's cash to just $180,000, an amount equal to what Knickerbocker Trust had paid out every four minutes during its run the day before. But as Morgan added up the value of the securities Thorne had brought, he would occasionally stop instruct that a loan be immediately made equal in amount to the value of the securities he'd just counted, then resume his counting. By TCA's closing time of 3 p.m., approximately $3 million in cash had been delivered and $12 million paid out to depositors, but TCA had survived. They were able to pay everyone who would lined up, Yet Morgan and Thorne knew the run would continue tomorrow unless stronger action was taken. As the banks and markets closed on the 23rd, the dough was at 58.21, down another 1.5% for the day and now down 14.0% for the month of October and 38.3% for the year. Morgan summoned the heads of all the New York Trust companies after the market's close. Once they were assembled, he said what they all knew. The problem was a trust company problem and the trust companies would have to solve it. He then shared what they didn't know. The Trust Company of America would need another $10 million to see it through tomorrow and it was up to the Trust Companies to pledge enough capital to save their rival. Morgan then promised that if the Trusts did their duty, the commercial banks and JP Morgan and company would make up any shortfall. Bankers Trust immediately pledged $1 million but the other trust companies bought. As they bickered, Morgan, 
so ill that some had recommended he not leave his bed that morning, napped in his chair. When he woke up 30 minutes later, the trust companies were no nearer to a resolution of their mutual problem. Morgan took a pencil and paper and announced that Bankers Trust had done its duty. He then twisted his arms, recording each commitment until he'd raised a total of $8.25 million, at which point he committed the other banks and his own firm for the balance. The next morning's newspapers announced that the Trust Company of America had been saved although another $9 million would be withdrawn that day, requiring the loan against collateral Morgan had predicted. Benjamin Strong was forced to carry the securities down Wall Street to the National City Bank, where he exchanged them for as much as $1 million in cash, which he stuffed in his pockets before running to replenish TCA's tellers. But as the trust companies had managed to save each other on Wednesday, on Thursday, 24th October, the banks were trying to save themselves and reduce their risk by calling in loans. The result was to completely absorb the available money supply. Stock prices were continuing to collapse. They had closed on Wednesday 43.5% below 1906 closing high, and as they did, the cost of short-term borrowing already at obscene levels as the banks called in loans reached 100%. The result was that any shares purchased with borrowed money were being sold indiscriminately. They were simply thrown on the market to bring whatever might be gotten for them, just as the brokers left holding shares of United Copper threw them on the market once Otto Heinz refused to pay. The stock exchange and all its member firms were in danger of failing under the torrent of liquidation. Early on Thursday afternoon, Ransom Thomas, president of the New York Stock Exchange, left the stock exchange building at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets, but rather than heading to the nearby offices of the U.S. Treasury for help crossed Broad Street and knocked on the door at 23 Wall Street. In this case, he was just another supplicant seeking an audience with the zoos of Wall Street. Thomas walked directly to Morgan's office and interrupted Morgan's conversation. Mr. Morgan, we will have to close the stock exchange. What? We will have to close the stock exchange, Thomas repeated. At what time do you usually close it? Morgan asked. Why? At 3 o'clock, Thomas answered. It must not close one minute before that hour today. Morgan said, according to his son-in-law, who later wrote that Morgan emphasized each word by keeping time with his right hand, the middle finger of it pointing straight at Thomas. Thomas muttered some description of the difficulty faced by the exchange and its member firms, which were finding it impossible to borrow money as each stock quotation was 10 points lower than the one before. Investors and speculators were rushing to sell their stock, some because they thought prices were going to weaken further, some because they simply had to. They had to because speculators had borrowed money from banks or their brokers and used it to buy stock with the shares serving as collateral, as Otto Heinz had done with the disastrous United Copper Pool. This is the simplest form of leverage. These loans were not without conditions. If the value of the stock securing the loan dropped, as it was doing now, the lender might require the borrower to deposit more collateral in the form of cash. The borrower could deposit that additional cash or sell his shares. In a more extreme response, 
the lender could demand repayment in full at any time and lenders on 24th October weren't giving borrowers the option of depositing more collateral, they were demanding full repayment of outstanding loans immediately. Since borrowers didn't have the cash, they'd used it to buy stock, they had to sell their stock. It was as if every mortgage lender demanded every homeowner pay off their mortgage immediately, all those who couldn't raise the money would be selling their homes simultaneously. There weren't enough buyers for all the stock being sold, there rarely are when everyone has to sell at the same moment. Thomas was there to ask Morgan, a man who abhorred stock speculation, for a loan that would allow stock speculators to pay off their original loans, extend the period in which they could liquidate their holdings, and end the panic. Thomas told Morgan he needed $25 million or else 50 brokerage houses would fail. His only alternative was to close the exchange early. Morgan knew that once a bank or trust company closed its doors early and told depositors it didn't have their money, the institution could never reopen. This is what had happened with the Knickerbocker Trust and what he had worked so hard to prevent for the Trust Company of America. Similarly, he knew that if the stock exchange had to close because of the selling, it might be a decade before it reopened. Morgan acted quickly, summoning the presidents of the banks in the neighborhood. By 2 p.m. they were assembled, and Morgan was succinct. Unless the men in the room could commit a total of $25 million in the next 15 minutes, at least 50 stock exchange firms would fail, also, the exchange would close and it might not reopen for years. Within five minutes the men had more than met their goal, $27 million had been allocated. When the announcement was made on the floor of the exchange that $27 million was ready to be loaned at 10% interest, a fraction of the 100% interest that had been demanded that morning, and an even tinier fraction of the 125% demanded by anyone with money to lend earlier that afternoon, one of the clerks responsible for recording names and loan amounts had his suit coat and vest ripped off in the chaos. The New York Stock Exchange closed on Thursday, 24th October, at its regular time. The Dow finished the day nearly unchanged at 58.18 and substantially above its low for the day, but it was still down by 38.3% for 1907 and 14.1% for the month of October. While stock exchange firms would need an infusion of another $13 million the next day, Friday, 25th October, the run on the Trust Company of America and the other trust companies slowed. In a two-week period, the TCA would pay out $34 million of its $64 million in deposits a staggering percentage that was survived only because of the ability and standing of J.P. Morgan. When the stock exchange closed on Friday, the fever had broken. It had posted a small gain and would advance modestly again on Saturday. Calm would slowly return in part because Morgan quietly called on religious leaders to encourage it during their upcoming Sunday sermons. When the closing bell rang on Thursday, 31st October, the dough was at 57.70, it had lost 14.8% for the month, about twice what it manages to gain in an average year, in the worst month it had ever had to that point and the worst single month it would ever have until the start of the Great Depression.
During that month, it lost ground on eight consecutive sessions and finished lower on 19 of the 27 trading days. Concerns would continue to echo, and the dough would display weakness during the remainder of the year before bottoming for good at 53.00 on 15th November, down 43.8% for 1907 and exactly 50 points below the high made in 1906. When the stock market closed on 31st December 1907, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had lost 37.7%, by far its worst ever annual performance until 1931, and still the second worst loss ever.